Hi, I'm Melinda Cusera, and welcome back to my channel and my series about Curse Breaker Enchanted. Today I'm going to read chapter 2 and do my best with the character voices. I'm not a voice actor, I'm an author. I'll do the best that I can with that. And afterwards we'll have maybe a little chat about what we just read. So let's get to it. For chapter 1, I'll put a link in the description so you can catch up on that if you missed it. Chapter 2. A densely muscled arm slipped around his neck and its mate secured itself around his waist. The two limbs crushed Sarn against a barrel chest. Where had that guy come from? Sarn cursed himself for not paying more attention to the corridor behind him. What the hell do you think you're doing? Grigori enunciated each word as if he spoke to an idiot, but Sarn couldn't drag in enough air to reply. His sight dimmed and his knees jellied as he struggled to regain his footing. Before everything blackened, Grigori let go. Sweet air tinged with sweat and a hint of body odor flowed in as the darkness rolled back, releasing Sarn. Thank fate for that. Sarn blinked at the older and much stronger ranger as he rubbed his neck. He couldn't wrap his mind around what had just happened. The rangers played rough, but not like this. Unless this was a lesson of some sort. But what was the lesson? Oh, stop it. I didn't squeeze you that hard. And besides, you aren't that fragile. Grigori rolled his eyes heavenward. Yeah, right, but Sarn bit his lip to keep his acerbic comments to himself. He staggered until a ham-sized fist forced him to sit on a nearby bench. Uh-oh. Grigori's angry eyes had zeroed in on a purpling bruise. Not good. Who did that to you? Grigori clenched his fists. The sight offended him. Sarn righted his hood so it covered the bruise in question and stood up. Indentured men had no rights. So what if a bunch of fools had jumped him? Complications made it better for all if Sarn kept his mouth shut. Besides, the incident had happened 15 hours ago and had no bearing on the ranger now glaring holes in his back. Maybe Grigori cared. What a frightening thought. Who hit you? Grigori demanded. Can't have the Lord of the Mountains property damaged. Oh no. Sarn swallowed the truth before it could pop out of his mouth. The truth had a nasty habit of doing that because his magic didn't allow him to lie. But his situation was far better than most, so Sarn kept his mouth shut. He was managing just fine without interference. Thank you very much. Still, he had to give the lout something. Any explanation would do as long as it was true. Grigori snapped his sausage fingers in front of Sarn's face, dragging him back to the problem at hand. Pay attention, boy. I asked you a question, and you're supposed to answer it, not stand there like a full wool gathering. Grigori hardened his glare. Sarn couldn't slip out of this one. Damn. He had to say something, preferably something that wasn't too damning, but nothing sprang to mind except the truth. Sarn studied the carvings under his boots. A long-banished race had chiseled a seething mass of insects into the rock, but they didn't offer any answers. The wind tugged his green ankle-length cloak again, pulling Sarn toward the balustrade and the distant forest, and he walked toward the sweeping view while searching for something to say. He suppressed a shudder as he approached the decorative railing. From the other side of the meadow, the enchanted forest watched Sarn. A voice whispered the same five syllables as before. Im Empire Eritor! Was it a warning? Jump urged his magic, sounding all too real as it repeated that word. Jump! 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 Why? Sarn asked. Why do you want me to jump? But once thought, the idea wouldn't go away. Why not jump for it? Sarn set his hands on the waist-high balustrade. All he had to do was throw his legs over the side and let go. Why not jump? The ground was far away, but he was standing on the side of a mountain, and the balcony on the level below this one wasn't far at all, perhaps forty feet at the most. Why shouldn't he jump? Down was where he needed to go. Sarn felt the invisible pull of his master for the night, Nolo. He must go to him. Jump! We'll catch you if you fall! His magic whispered in his ear. Yes, it would do that. It always had in the past. The temptation was almost too much to bear. Sarn leaned out over the railing, craving that moment of total freedom in the fall. But it never came. Grigori seized his arm and yanked Sarn away from the balustrade and temptation. What the hell is wrong with you? First you go all silent and brooding on me like a recalcitrant child. Then you spout nonsense. And for fate's sake, are you trying to fall? Grigori spun Sarn around to face him. The ranger is red-faced and screaming now. Maybe I should have let you crack your foolish head open. That fall might have knocked some sense into you because nothing else has. Grigori paused for breath and shook his head. His anger had abated as suddenly as it had come on. I'll only ask this once more. What the hell is going on with you? 
His dark eyes bored into Sarn, leaving nowhere to hide. But Grigori had asked a valid question. Unfortunately, it was the one question Sarn couldn't answer truthfully or he'd lose custody of his son which left Sarn with a dilemma because he had to say something. Grigori couldn't let this go. It had gone too far now. The wind died, and so too did the strange spell that had overtaken Sarn. He no longer felt like jumping. Sarn turned away from the hard eyes boring into him. What the hell had he just been thinking? Now that he was free of his magic's mad muttering, Sarn stood there, dazed, confused, and unable to form a reply. What could he say that Grigori would believe, let alone understand? Nothing, because the big lug didn't share his body with a power that wanted him to use it as often as possible. Grigori took his silence the wrong way, as usual. Look, kid. I'm not a kid anymore. Sarn folded his arms over his chest until Grigori seized his shoulder and shook him. You can tell me what's going on, or you can tell Jurilo, but you're telling someone. Do you hear me, boy? The 40 bruiser looked ready to plant himself in front of something in need of guarding, but nothing on the balcony required such protection. I turned 20 last November. I'm not a child. Sarn clenched his hands into tight fists. Then don't act like one. Grigori shook him one last time to make his point. Sarn rolled his glowing eyes skyward, but there was no help from that quarter, just the first stars of the night. A unicorn statue with a broken horn gave him the stink eye as Grigori spun on his heel and headed for the arch, marking the entrance to the arcade that ran around the balcony. Even the statuary had an opinion tonight. Bind your eyes so you don't cause a panic and let's go. They're looking for you. Grigori fished a blindfold out of his pocket and thrust it at him. Sarn took it with nerveless fingers. Who's looking for me? Don't be an idiot. You know who. Grigori looked to the sky for patience, but it didn't seem to help him. When Sarn continued to stand there, the big ranger grabbed the blindfold and covered his eyes with it. After that humiliating experience, his muscular hand landed on Sarn's arm again. He doesn't trust me to follow him. He acts like I have a choice in the matter. Sarn seethed, but he kept his thoughts to himself. Tonight was off to a fine start, and Sarn hadn't even started work yet. He suppressed a sigh of frustration. Things could only get worse from here. Grigori's heavy boots beat a metronome of doom as he towed Sarn toward the trouble his magic had sensed. Grigori was a man on a mission. Sarn wished he wasn't part of that mission, but he was, so he plodded along next to the ranger when traffic allowed and tried not to step on his heels when it didn't. All the while, Grigori maintained his death grip on him. Sarn felt like a rag doll as the big lug dragged him through the evening crowd. Everyone headed somewhere tonight. Let go of me, Sarn said for the fifth time since they left the balcony. I'll follow you on my own, if his magic complied. It was a sullen green star parked in front of his eyes. His magic extruded green rays and poked at the blindfold, cutting it off from the world. Sarn tried to ignore it, but it was hard to ignore all that green light right in front of his face. With the blindfold on, it had no choice but to shine back into him through his eyes, and that wasn't a pleasant feeling. Heat felt like it was building up under the blindfold, and it might be. A strong enough light could heat an object. Could the light his eyes produce cook his eyes in their sockets? His magic stopped testing the blindfold, but it didn't answer his question. Maybe he should stop thinking about such things and hurry Grigori along. Just keep walking, Grigori said finally, startling Sard out of his thoughts. He'd forgotten he'd even asked the man a question, but Grigori was still angry at Sarn for not answering his questions. He tightened his grip on Sarn and increased his already relentless pace, but Sarn had no trouble matching it since he was two inches taller than the big brawny Grigori, who plowed through the crowd as if he had every right to. But people didn't get out of Grigori's way. Didn't they sense the man's restrained fury? It was dying to break free, and Sarn was his target since he'd pissed off the ranger. Too bad Grigori didn't have any magic to part the crowd. Sarn did, but his magic had no interest in the people in their way. Its sole focus right now was the blindfold. His magic hated confinement, but it was all too happy to dwell within him if it could look out at the world around him. Stop that, Sarn muttered under his breath as his magic stabbed the blindfold with another green ray. Stop what? Grigori probably hadn't meant to swing Sarn into a hapless passerby, but the poor sap collided with him anyway, striking Sarn right in the chest with something hard probably the poor guy's head. Watch where you're going, you big- Oh, the irate fellow broke off when he saw the blindfold. He stepped aside. Sorry about that. I didn't see you. Otherwise, I'd have steered the kid around you, Grigori said to the man as he dragged Sarn away. The rangers never used his name in public if they could avoid it. Hence the whole kid thing. Sarn knew he should let it go, but he just couldn't. At 15, it was fine, but he was a man now. I'm not a kid. You're whatever I say you are. Now let's go. We've got somewhere to be. And for fate's sake, try not to run into anything or anyone else. How can I do that when I can't see a bloody thing? But that wasn't true. Sarn had other ways of seeing. 
they just weren't working because his magic had quit paying attention to anything except the blindfold. Will you quit poking it and help me? Sarn directed that thought at his magic as something caught his foot. He fell forward, but Grigori yanked him backward and he didn't fall flat on his face. What's wrong with you? Grigori leans in close for a face-to-face -face chat. His breath reeked of onions. Can't you walk five feet without falling? This isn't the first time you've come through here. Use your mind for something. Grigori tapped the spot between Sarn's eyes with a thick finger, then set off at a brisk pace. But he was right. Sarn had an extra set of senses thanks to his magic, and Grigori had just told him to use them. If only it were that easy. Sarn squelched the part of his mind that counted the number of times he'd taken this crowded corridor. He didn't need to know. I'm trying. Don't try, just do it. Because time was running out, Grigori didn't have to say it. Sarn felt time sliding away from him as he stumbled again over something in his path, but he didn't know what he was hurrying toward. Hurry, hurry, no time to tarry, no time to talk, hurry, hurry, time seemed to say, though Sarn was probably imagining that to explain the terrible urgency that had gripped him. Time beat a metronome on his skull, counting down the seconds until the bells of Mount Eredrin would speak the hour, declaring him late but I'm never late, a small voice whispered inside Sarn. Belatedly, he realized it was his voice shaking in fear at the very notion. Don't ring, don't ring. Sarn broke into a run and pulled a sputtering Grigori in his wake. Somehow that burly ranger avoided running into people. What the devil's gotten into you, boy? Grigori must have clipped a passing woman because she shouted curses at him. Not good, not good at all, but Sarn couldn't slow down. Time wasn't on his side. If he could clear a path through this crowd... The thought summoned his magic, and it pushed out of him as he ran, encasing Sarn in a bubble of green light only he could see. As that luminous bubble swelled, it pushed the people he was hurtling toward aside. Sarn could see them now, a sea of amber people icons parted on the map unfolding inside his mind. If they ever discovered what he was, they'd kill him. But Sarn ignored that for now. If his green glowing eyes stayed covered, his secret was safe, and so was he. A bell tolled twenty times, startling Sarn out of his reverie, and he tripped over something, a drop parcel maybe, as his head map vanished suddenly, leaving just the glow of his magic behind. No, 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 I'm never late. Sarn shook his head to negate that as the echoes of those bells faded away. Sure, he'd come close many times, but Sarn had never been late. Not that he could remember anyway, but his memory was full of holes. There's a first time for everything, kid. Grigori squeezed the arm he was still holding. His hand was long enough to encircle Sarn's wrist like a fleshy manacle. Now put that away before it shines through the blindfold. Grigori meant his magic, of course. All the rangers avoided using that dreaded M word whenever Sarn was in earshot. But I'm never late. I can't be. My magic doesn't allow it, Sarn protested. Don't say it. Don't say that word. Grigori shook his arm in case his words hadn't gotten through. Keep walking. Nolo's waiting for you. Grigori took the lead as the crowd filled the corridor again. But Sarn felt like a fool for repeating the same thing. Lateness was a whipping offense, and the promises he'd sworn would punish him for disobeying a direct order. But they weren't. Did being in Grigori's custody count as on time? To his magic, which enforced his oath to serve the rangers, it must, because that oath lay quietly inside him. Am I on time? I'm with you and you're a ranger. How should I know? I'm just supposed to fetch you, Grigori said as they shuffled forward, only to stop because the crowd had. That wasn't encouraging. Make way! Rangers on an errand! That's right, make a hole! We've got important business to attend to! People must have stepped aside at Grigori's request, because the barrel-chested ranger strode more quickly toward his goal, pulling Sarn along in his wake, hopefully not toward a whipping. If that muscle-bound ranger vouched for him, then maybe he'd get away with just a warning. Sarn chewed the inside of his cheek as he considered his chances of that happening. Given the man's current attitude, Grigori probably wouldn't vouch for him. Damn. Sarn picked up the pace. They needed a faster route, and his head map usually had one. Sarn yanked it into view, and his map routed him around the statues directly in front of him. Thanks for that. Sarn sent that thought to his magic. But it didn't reply. It was too busy probing the blindfold for a way out until a snatch of conversation caught its attention. They're moving around, a man said in awe, but he wasn't Grigori. Who's moving around? Sarn turned toward the voice. It was an amber man-shaped icon on his map, but Grigori dragged him away. They're not letting anyone through, another man said as they passed him. He sounded deeply concerned and a little scared, but scared of what? It just isn't natural. Another passerby added in that what are you going to do tone everyone adopted when something weird happened. Sarn almost stopped in his tracks again. His magic had made a similar claim right before Grigori had shown up. But Grigori just kept cutting through the crowd, putting his height to excellent use, and Sarn had no choice but to follow. They were both well over six feet tall, 
and their long strides soon left the crowd far behind. But those snatches of conversation stayed with Sarn as he veered around another statue, his magic helpfully pointed out on his head map. What exactly had he overheard? Enough to prove what he'd sensed earlier wasn't a fluke. Something was going on, and the rangers must be hit deep in it. No wonder Grigori was so short with him. What were they talking about? Sarn asked. Perhaps he could goad Grigori into talking. That muscular ranger couldn't stay silent for long. Grigori would burst if he didn't talk to someone. Never you mind, Grigori said. The ground vanished under Sarn's feet, but he'd expected that. Thank fate for his head map. Without it, Sarn would have tumbled down into the bowels of the mountain instead of stepping lightly onto the first itty-bitty step. Sarn touched the wall enclosing the staircase to steady himself, because there was no railing. Information kept pouring into his skull. It boiled over onto his map and updated it while Sarn reeled from the sudden deluge. Stop that. I don't care if you found an interesting freeze to investigate. Show me the damn steps so I don't fall. Sarn whispered to his magic. He didn't care if Grigori heard him. His head was so full of information. Sarn couldn't focus on anything else. He needed to concentrate. These steps were smaller than his feet. One misstep could send Sarn hurtling down into the bowels of the mountain if he wasn't careful, especially since he couldn't see them. His map wasn't helping either. It careened wildly as each additional detail appeared on it. Sarn had caged his magic for too long. It spread through the stairwell until a familiar archer icon appeared below, promising answers, which Sarn probably wouldn't get because the rangers never told him anything unless they had to. Maybe they'd have to tonight. It felt different from other nights and more sinister, but Sarn might have imagined that because he wanted things to change. Then there was no more time for such wool gathering. His magic focused on the staircase, and Sarn rushed down them to the next landing, taking them three at a time before his magic looked at something else. Sarn had a feeling nothing good awaited him as Grigori fiddled with the catch to a secret door. But Sarn couldn't turn back now. He'd given his word five summers ago, and there was no taking it back. A promise was a promise, and never mind the consequences. His knights belonged to the rangers. He must do whatever they told him to do. But Sarn had an awful feeling about tonight that he just couldn't shake, as the mechanism that operated the secret door made a grinding sound. Just when the echoes of metal rubbing on metal became unbearable, they stopped. Fresh air flowed into the dank stairwell laden with pollen and a hint of something darker, lending the night an ominous tone. Sarn hoped he'd imagine that as a hand landed on his shoulder and pushed, but he didn't think so. The night felt wrong in some undefinable way. And that is all we have for chapter two today. So chapter two continues to build on what we started with in the first chapter, which is to take Sarn from an overpowered hero who has a lot of magic and there's a lot of things that he can do with it. And we're adding some constraints. So we have some constraints that he put on himself, which is the promises that he has made. They bind him to his word and it's unbreakable. Then we have the blindfold. He's got to follow orders, so Grigori is one of the rangers and outranks Sarn. Everybody in the rangers outranks Sarn, so he has to do what he's told. And we also see a little bit more about the relationship Sarn has with his magic. It doesn't always do what he wants it to do. It has a mind of its own sometimes, and it doesn't like to be confined. It doesn't like the fact that Sarn has got all these constraints on himself, and it's resisting that. You see it poking at the blindfolds. It can't remove it because Sarn has to follow orders and Gory told him to bind his eyes. So it's stuck and it's not happy. And Sarn needs it to navigate through these tunnels. And well, they're not really tunnels because Mount Eregerin is actually a mountain. And it's kind of like Khazad-dûm in The Lord of the Rings in Middle Earth. An ancient race of stone mages carved out an actual city with all sorts of carvings and all sorts of decorations like this beautiful place inside the mountain they're into living subterranean life so that's what we got in chapter two so we'll see what happens in chapter three we'll meet nolo and maybe we'll go to another location we'll see what's outside the mountain thank you for listening and i hope you'll come back for chapter three Please like and subscribe. It really helps the channel and you'll be notified when the next one drops. The characters are very interested in that next one coming out sooner rather than later. So I'd intended to do one a week since I do work full time and I'm also writing the next books in the series. But the characters would like me to do this more often than that. So we'll see. I'll do as many as I can per week around my work schedule with my day job. So see you back here maybe in a couple of days.
Also, Curse Breaker Enchanted is available right now as an ebook, and there's an AI narrated version of the audiobook. It's also available in paperback and hardback, so if you want to read ahead or read along, go ahead and pick it up. There's a link in the description. Thank you so much.